Welcome to Philanthropy in Action. I am Maxim Thorne, and I teach Philanthropy in Action here at Yale University. I'm delighted today to have as our guest Donna Dubinsky. Donna has had a most remarkable career in the field of technology. She's a first in so many areas. Donna, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Donna, I was so looking forward to this conversation because it is so rare to have, one, uh, a breakthrough artist in the field of technology uh, who has your particular background and who has decided to also become engaged philanthropically. What motivated you to bring these two aspects of your life together? Well, I think it comes upon you gradually. I uh, was not born into a wealthy family. I mean, a solid middle-class environment, to be sure, but not great wealth. Um, but my parents were always very um, generous in giving of their time and, and their money. And so I was, I was raised in an environment where it was important to give back. But you don't, I don't think you really understand the implications of, of having great wealth until you, know, you get kind of close to that point yourself. And uh, as I did start to get into that position myself over the years, it became clear, more clear to me that I had to start thinking about what the implications were of that. And I think the number one implication for me was, as I thought about it, that I had been able to take advantage of so many things that society had provided for me whether my public school growing up or my parents paying for my college or Yale and all of it had to offer, and that it was really my responsibility now to do that for the next generation. And, and I had to start to kind of think about that and think about how to go about that, which is it's not an easy thing to think about, and uh, how you do that thoughtfully and responsibly and, and with the most amount of impact. And I think I got, I got kind of turned off of the idea of inherited wealth. Um, I think both from a perspective of society as well as from the perspective of, of an individual. Um, from a society perspective, it just seems to me it doesn't generate as much uh, creativity and innovation. And from an individual perspective, I, I think it's almost demotivational. Somebody doesn't really have to work hard for, for what they're getting. So, you know. I, I, for ourselves, in my family, my husband and I, we've sort of said, okay, we're going to take care of our family. We're going to make sure nobody's out in the cold or struggling or they're safe. They're safe. Uh, but after that, I think uh, the rest of, of what we've been able to uh, earn based on the privileges we've had in our society, uh, we think we should be giving back. Um, tell us a little bit about the uh, trajectory you've had. Um, so that so that we get a sense of of how you moved from a solidly middle class background uh, through being the CEO of Palm uh, and and getting and and growing your wealth base. How did that happen? And and is there a connection to you being an entrepreneur to your views about inherited wealth? Well, uh, sure, there's, there's definitely a connection there. I mean, I, I mean, my story is I went, I came to Yale. I uh, had never really been exposed to education like this. I went to a very poor public high school where I did not get a good education. So where I, was that? In Benton Harbor, Michigan. And I came here totally unprepared for the academic rigor of Yale, um, not like you guys today where you get <coughs> so much great prep to come here. Um, I, I was really, it was a struggle for me in my first couple of years here to figure out how to study and how to write papers and all those kind of things. Um, but I just thrived in it. I just loved it. I, I loved this place. I loved everything I could learn from it. And uh, then I went out into the working world for a couple of years. I went to a bank in Philadelphia as a trainee and loved the business world and decided that's where I wanted to focus. I went back to business school at Harvard and, and got my MBA. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I um, had been in the bank, and I'd seen um, entrepreneurs in action. And I, I got kind of excited then about entrepreneurship. It was uh, mainly cable TV systems. It was, you probably can't relate to this, but in the very, very beginning of cable TV, when they were just installing it, it was a very entrepreneurial venture, small guys doing it town by town by town. And I was financing them, so I got to know them and really appreciate them. And I decided that I was really interested in, in entrepreneurial activities. And then um, Apple Computer came to campus to recruit the first time they ever came to Harvard Business School. 
Uh, they were interviewing for technical people. I was not a technical person, so they didn't accept me for an interview, but uh, I went and sat outside the interview room all day. And every time the interviewer came out and said, you know, I had to reintroduce myself to her and say, I'm here to see you. And she'd say, well, you're not on my schedule. And I'd say, oh, I know, but I need to talk to you because I really need to come work for Apple. So uh, by the end of the day, she agreed to sit down and talk to me. And I ended up being the only person who was hired uh, from the Harvard Business School to go to Apple. So it was kind of interesting. And I ended up in a logistics role, an operations role. I won't go through all the details because it goes on and on. Uh, but um, I just, I loved the fast pace, I loved the innovation, I loved, it was a crazy time at Apple, I mean just hyper growth and I got responsibility very quickly and uh, just really got a taste for uh, on the entrepreneurial and innovative and product innovation and all those things. So uh, I wanted to stick with that. Uh, when I left Apple I took a year off and, and decided that I really wanted to try to run something. I felt like I had um, the skills to be a CEO, I wanted to try to be a CEO, and I came back specifically looking for a CEO opportunity in a s very small startup, and that's when I met my business partner, Jeff, who I'm now on my third company with, and uh, as co-founder of Palm. And then, you know, back to kind of circle back to the wealth question, um, you know, joining a startup and getting a, a piece of it is uh, certainly how you have an opportunity to build wealth. So. Uh, now, I was hired at Palm as the CEO, so I got kind of a percentage as a CEO. Um, and then in our second company, I was a co-founder. So I had a significantly higher percentage of the second company as a co-founder. And then, ironically enough, we sold the second company back to the first company, <laughs> and I ended up with more of Palm the second time around than I had the first time around, which I always loved. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how it happened, and then the, you know, the company went public and did well, and so I did well. Um, and uh, that's the story, so I, I'm not sure where Well, where I know the, the students went. have exactly <laughs> questions that are related to what you just said. Okay. Um, because one of the challenges from the philanthropic movement point of view is how do you replicate the, what has been so successful in, in, in the business world and in this new field of social entrepreneurship and and uh, venture capital and uh, all the things that have made people involved in technology so successful innovation serial you know those kinds of things and how c are, are those lessons that could ha add value to the philanthropic world but so Dan sure well I have a related question so the technologies that you've developed throughout your career have changed the lives of millions of people um, for the better um, hopefully. And, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it, it would be, you know, poss possibly easy for you to just sort of say, well, that's my contribution. Um, you've also chosen to give philanthropically in a variety <laughs> of ways as well. And I guess I'm just wondering, do you feel, was that a, a choice of yours? Do you think that's sort of an obligation that, you know, binds someone else as well? Like, is, can your career be the sole extent of your philanthropy or does it go deep, uh, deeper than that? Well, I guess, um, I think your career is an important part of your giving back. Um, I think not just making devices that change people's lives and make their worlds better, but also building an ethical, responsible uh, company that contributes to a community that's, um, that's taking care of its suppliers and its employees and everybody in the whole ecosystem. I mean, I really see it, a company as uh, as an ethical entity too, and that it needs to be able to balance the needs of multiple constituencies. I mean, you might want to raise prices, but that might you know, impact your investors positively, but your customers negatively. So these are always a, a balancing act of, of how do you manage these things together. And I think thinking that through and understanding, I mean, your ecosystem touches so many people. I mean, I had however many thousand employees we had in the company, but we were touching the lives of of vast multiples of that all the way down through the supply chain. Anybody in China who made the display, who then shipped it through a trucking company and then so on and so forth. So, uh, so I think that needs to be an, an ethical system and you need to think about that um, from that perspective. Um, but in addition to that, so then you have this money that you make as a result, which I think for some people it's a scorecard and they want to hang on to it because they, don't, they think they're losing score and they're losing points if they give it away. Um, but for me, it's really an additional way to make an impact in other ways. And for me, it's just a treasure to be able to use it in that way. 
I mean, I spend it on myself too. I have things I enjoy, but um, but I really love to have the opportunity to make a difference in the world in other ways, in addition to the ways that I've made a difference in the company. Um, Donna, on th on that, Bill Bill Gates uh, posited this idea of uh, creative capitalism, in which he broadened the uh, the notion that the, one can have an ethical company and a company can uh, play a broader role than just profit maximization for shareholders and in that way we can actually see multiple returns to society beyond um, you know the, the the great product that the company makes or for the shareholder money that they will give as a residual because that's their money to give but the company itself can be ethical and have an impact. But a lot of people oppose that view and say, no, companies should be limited to profit maximization, sort of in the Friedman sense. Do you agree with that? I think profit maximization is really a too narrow of a definition of the role of the company. I'm, I'd say I'm more on Bill Gates' side on this, that um, you know, the company is, is a, m a member of the community in some sense and needs to play a role in the broad, broadly defined community. And, um, you know, uh, you have to be careful about it because certainly you have to pay attention to profits and investors as one very key element of that community because if you don't pay attention to them, they're not going to keep financing your company and you're not going to have a company and all your wonderful things for employees are going to go away. So um, I think, you know, it's a balancing act. It's all about being um, balanced. But I think that um, part of that balance is are those other constituencies. So I don't understand the notion of taking one constituency, investors, and putting them way above all of those other constituencies. To me, that that's not, doesn't make sense uh, intellectually, but it also doesn't make sense for the long-term health of the company. I think the long-term health of the company will be far better if the company is trying to balance all those constituencies. Having a great place for employees to work, for example. Now you could say investors would be better served if you try to pay people the lowest possible amount, but I think in the end, investors are better served if the employees are happy and thriving and building careers and enjoying themselves and being creative and innovative. So, you know, it all plays together. It's, it's very complex. Linda. Hi. Uh, so I know that um, people often say you either win or lose, but, you know, I sometimes think you either win or learn. So I was wondering, as an entrepreneur, as a serial entrepreneur, um, can you give us an example of when you have failed and learned from such failures? Oh, I failed so often, I don't know where to start. Um, <laughs> well, you know, our early years at Palm were very, very difficult. We created our first product was a failure. We did a product with Casio where we did the software and they did the hardware. And it was uh, one of the very earliest handhelds. It was called the Zoomer. I wish I brought it with me. It's like this big and uh, very ugly by today's standards. But it was a really uh, a breakthrough product at the time. Uh, but it wasn't very good, and it didn't do a lot, and it was expensive, and so it was a total failure. And, you know, we had to figure out how to move forward as a company after that, and we learned an awful lot. We learned a lot about what customers did want and what they didn't want, and how much they would pay and how much they wouldn't pay, and all these things. And that's what the Palm Pilot was born out of, was all of that learning. And um, we, unfortunately, were not able to finance that vision. I mean, we had a very clear vision. We had a very clear product plan. We were marching down that, and nobody was interested in financing. So I was unsuccessful in raising money to finance that product, which ultimately became a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, so we ended up selling the company in order to finance the product to another company. So uh, that's a kind of, you know, I mean, it, it's all been a, an incredible series of ups and downs and ups and downs. And it's taken just huge, you know, persistence and tenacity to, actually take those learnings and turn them into something. I mean, when we sold the company, many people called and they said, congratulations, what are you going to do next? And it was like, no, 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 we sold the company in order to finance it and bring this product to market. I'm staying right here and finishing what I've started. It, it wasn't the idea of, oh, turn something and make some money and go on and do something else. We believed that this product could make a big difference in people's lives, and we wanted to get this product on the market, and selling the company was the means to the end, not the end. So, uh, so that's what we did. But you know, and and I mean, I could give you a, a million other examples. I mean, it's been um, a, a whole career, in effect, of um, 
of mistakes and learning and adjustment and mistakes and learning and adjustment and just a constant um, stream of, of reacting to what you're learning from the environment. Linda, is, is, was there a reason that you asked that question? Yes, well, I've been um, attending a lot of conferences recently, and I'm a part of a, the social enterprise called ISEC. And we have been, um, we just started at Yale maybe three years ago, and we've been tr trying new ways to get people excited about ISEC, trying new ways to get more um, of our product out there, which is international exchange. And a lot of these conferences revolve around ideas exchange, um, people coming together to talk about how they failed, how they won, mm. um, how they understood how we can move on um, in ISEC. So I was just wondering. Um, yeah. Well, it's an iterative process. You know, you do the best you can at your first shot, whether, you know, it's a, a group and what the charter is or a product, whatever. And, and then you listen, and you got to be a good listener. Listen to the, your customers, your suppliers, your employees, everybody around you is thinking about this, and then keep making adjustments. We just did that in my current company just this week. We made an adjustment in our strategy based on what we're hearing from our beta customers. So uh, if, you, if you stick rigidly to your first thought there and don't learn from what's going on, then uh, I think for sure you're going to fail, for sure. Uh, um, Donna, listening to you, I think there's a special intelligence, a different intelligence that comes from people from Silicon Valley, people who are involved in technology. Because one of the things that you have said, to rephrase it, is that you, you embrace failure. Because to come up with something new, it's OK to fail and to learn from that. In a lot of the philanthropic world, that is anathema. Mm. It's as if everything you invest in is supposed to be successful. And the idea that one can be innovative or come up with multiple strategies is seen as risky or not the best use of a donor's funds. But it seems that people with your background tend to embrace a different view so that you can come up with some different solutions that have been tried. Do you, do you agree with that statement? Well, I'm, I think you embrace failure and it's okay to fail, but you don't want to do it too many times. <laughs> I mean, there's a limit. And um, I think that it, as long as, if you're a, a philanthropic organization, as long as you position something as experimental, here, we're going to give this a try. Here's what we hope to learn from it. Here's how we're going to react to what we learn from it. Here's what we're trying to learn, whatever. Then I think it's perfectly fine to go into that eyes wide open and say, this may work, this may not work. Um, I think the mistake is if you say, oh, we're sure this is going to work, this is, you know, absolutely the right thing to do, and we're all set, and boom, and then it doesn't work, then you've really reduced your credibility a lot. So it's, it's an awful lot about positioning up front, about humility, about understanding really deeply what you know and what you don't know. I mean, you know, right now we have an incredible technology that we're working on. We know for sure that this is breakthrough technology. This is important stuff. We don't really know how it intersects yet with user needs. So we're working on that, and we know we don't know that. So that's why we're sort of making course corrections now. But being able to articulate and understand what you know and what you don't know and being totally, brutally honest with that to yourself, to your teammates, to your uh, investors, your funders is, I think, incredibly important. Thank you. Lipi. Hi, um, I was wondering, um, in, this, in this book we read by David Bornstein in How to Change the World, he emphasizes the role of the social entrepreneur, essentially um, a philanthropist who approaches social problems in the same way she might approach business problems. And I was hoping to gain your perspective on what you might think about that process and also how you might approach social issues. You know, I've been a, a little more in the skeptical camp on the whole social entrepreneurship notion, um, partly because what I've seen is, is running a nonprofit and doing things for a nonprofit is fundamentally different than running a for-profit. And, you know, in spite of what I said earlier about, you know, balancing constituencies, constituencies I believe that a for-profit has to be a for-profit. I mean, quite seriously. Otherwise, it's not going to survive and endure over the long run and grow and thrive. And a not-for-profit is a very different thing. And, and I feel there's been a little bit of hubris in my community of saying, 
oh, we know better how to run these nonprofits because we've run these other companies so well. And some of the things translate and some of the things don't translate and are, are a very different environment. And I feel like there are some really stunning uh, philanthropies out there who do a, a wonderful job of creating enormous value, enormous products, services for people who need it. And uh, we shouldn't be dismissive of them as saying, oh, they're not social entrepreneurs. I think we should learn from them because I think they know a lot about how to do that right. So I, I, know, I, feel, I feel a little more respectful of that community that, that, I, that I hear when I hear this sort of social entrepreneurship notion. You know, I, I love the fact that you talked about the hubris because it has been, especially in the last, say, the, the bilanthropy moment, the Bill Gates moment, in which a lot of people who are brilliant and have a particular kind of talent believe that that talent is directly translatable uh, to the, the world of you know, poverty alleviation or getting rid of major diseases or um, fixing education. But, but you wonder uh, what, the, what that is built on because there have been people working on these, uh, these issues for yeah. a long time. Yeah, and I think they're really different and hard, hard issues in other ways. Now, they, certainly these people such as myself or, or the, the other people who do this bring values. I mean, the idea of, you know, of how you create management systems and how you have measurement systems and how you you know create teams I mean there's a whole bunch of great stuff that that does carry over but there's other things that don't I mean the most the most significant one in my view that I've learned you know partly being here as a part of the community at Yale too is that um, you know in an in a for-profit enterprise as the CEO anybody who's not somebody I want on my team I can fire and that's one of your most important tools to managing your organization is who is there around the table and are they the right people or not? And that's not always true. In the education system, you can't just go in and fire the people who you don't think are performing. You know, you've got restrictions on that that the society has agreed to place on that. And so, you know, there are real hardcore differences that I think people from my world get in there and just tear their hair out because they just can't believe they can't make things happen the way they're used to making things happen. I, I'm so glad, you know, um, one of our previous guests was Julian Bond, the mm. great civil rights icon. And when you think about social change um, and equality for African Americans or for women or for the LGBT community, how do you fire a movement? Who in the movement do you fire? And how does a person who is expert in supplier monopoly or expert delivery systems, you know, of, of medicines, which are great, but how are those translatable when you're dealing with trying to do a systemic change for social justice? Yeah, but, I, but people it's a very hard problem, I know. People think they can do it, they can reinvent everything. So, but anyway, I, I do think there are things that are really wonderful that that community brings in, and there's other things they just have to learn, they have to learn themselves. Stephen. Hi. Um, <laughs> so. Some of the largest problems facing the world's poorest people today are issues of global health, economic development, and political corruption. What role, if any, do you see the tech industry playing in addressing these problems? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I think that um, certainly there are products that can make a difference. I think, generally speaking, access to information that has grown in the last decade in a way the world has never before seen has, has got to help that situation. Because I think as people in those places get more educated and informed about what the rest of the world is like, what their options are, how other societies manage, uh, I think they will, um, they will rise up and they will make a difference in their own lives. I don't think you know, the tech world is going to come in and magically solve any specific thing. But, Certainly, as we've seen um, with the Arab Spring last year, the role of technology was, you know, really enormous. And we always said at Palm, you know, Palm was always about um, 
that personal computing would be mobile computing, that the future of personal computing was mobile computing, and that your device on you would be your access to the world, and much more so than your desktop device. Your desktop device, a couple thousand dollars, with an IT person for every 10 devices, uh, with lots of support, lots of, you know, that just was never gonna fly into the poor parts of the world in terms of being a reasonable way for, for people to get access to the rest of the world and, and information on the internet. But these handheld devices could get cheap enough to do that. And we always said there'll be more accesses to the internet from a handheld device, particularly in the poorer parts of the world, than from desktop devices. And I believe that is happening. I think the explosion of, of software-based cell phones with technology to get on the internet is democratizing information in a way the world has never seen before. So, uh, you know, I think that's probably the biggest impact you can have is education and information and then see where people go with it, you know? It's just too big of an issue to take on directly. Leslie. Hey, um, thank you again for coming. Um, my question is related to risk, which of course is an important part of the business world, and how you manage risk in your philanthropy. Um, so specifically, I was wondering whether you have a preference between investing in an individual and maybe that individual's one brilliant idea or in a more stable investment, um, say a larger group that's well established? I think we want to invest a lot in leaders. And that leader could be an individual, that leader could be the head of an you know, enormous organization. But uh, for my husband and I, we, we, it really is very important that we believe in the person themselves who is executing. And, we're willing to put our money where we think somebody can deliver what they're offering to deliver. I mean, they're really kind of, it's, it's like an investment in a business in some sense because they are, people want to invest in the team and that's what I want to do. I want to invest in the team. I want to believe it's somebody who can really uh, do what, what they, they say they could do. And so um, for us, we've invested both in uh, very, very large organizations we've supported and we've supported some very small organizations too when we see somebody who we think is really passionate and really capable and executing well and a mission that's consistent with the things that we're trying to accomplish, uh, we'll do that as well. That We wouldn't be restricted by that at all. But if we see an organization where we don't think the leadership is very good, then we, we wouldn't go there. The other thing we do, which I think is interesting, is we really do due diligence on people who we you know, give money to. So we want to see their books. We want to see that they're profitable. We want to see, uh, not profitable, that they're break even, that they're not, you know, losing money. We want to see that they're, um, they've got good governance, that they've got systems in place to review their CEO, that they're thinking about a board and how they get good board members on it, that, you know, we like to see good governance in an organization to know that it can endure, to know that if it runs in a uh, difficulties that it's going to get through those difficulties and, it, and it's going to go on. This though is potentially problematic because isn't it okay to have a limited time span because th there are some entities that should in fact exist but exist for a limited duration and I'm sure you wouldn't disagree with that that it's okay if the lifespan is five years or ten years with, with, the, with what, if, they, if they've resolved the issue that they were set up to be. Right. Yes, but that would need to be deliberate. I mean, I think the organization would say to itself, okay, here's our mission. When, when our mission is accomplished, we're going to fold up shop and go away. Mind you, I think that never happens. I think it should happen more than it does happen because uh, organizations have a way of perpetuating themselves. They have a way of saying, okay, well, let's find something else to do if we uh, are done with this thing. Um, but, you know, let's say hypothetically an organization came to terms with that and said this is, our, this is what we want to accomplish and let's get through it and accomplish it. Um, good governance wouldn't prevent you from, from achieving that. Good governance would uh, enable you to achieve that, in my view. Right. McLean. Uh, well, along similar lines, um, I was curious, I, as you've expanded Numenta and Palm, um, I was curious why you had chosen to, or why you have chosen to donate to Yale, um, a huge organization that uh, receives many mm -hmm. uh, monetary donations every year, huge monetary donations. And I was curious, uh, you know, as a class uh, ourselves, as a seminar that has $100,000 to work with, 
uh, what do you advise for us? Uh, you chose to donate to a large organization like Yale versus a smaller organization. And you know, searching and looking into various organizations ourselves, we're wondering why, whether we should choose the Against Malaria Foundation that ha uh, serves m many, um, many people that suffer from malaria in, um, in African countries that support, you know, they, they give nets and that go over the beds and uh, it saves many lives. Or should we look towards more to locally to the Columbus House that, um, you know, provides a safe haven for mm -hmm. um, people suffering from homelessness right in our area. And I was wondering kind of what you suggest for us and, and where we should look and, and yeah. what, you know. That's a, that's a great question. There, first of all, I will tell you this, there's no bad cause. So if you're looking for the ones to come in, we can say, you know what, that's a bad cause. We're not going to invest in it. It just doesn't exist. All the causes are good. And you can sit here for the next 24 hours and tell me great causes. So uh, one does need to choose. And my husband and I kind of confronted this issue a few years ago and said, because we were just kind of randomly just picking things that sounded interesting and, you know, not really thinking about it. And we decided we had to think about this and be more deliberate about it. And so we actually came up with a system, and um, this is what our system looks like. I think you have to think about your own system, but I'll share our system with you. Um, we came up with a matrix, and we said across the top are things that are important to us. So the arts, education, addressing poverty, we're Jewish, so Jewish issues, whatever. We had, you know, the things across the top. And then down the side, we had kind of regional, local, um, regional, national, international. And then we took everything we were giving, all the dollars, and we plotted them in, in this to just say, well, what are we doing? Let's start out with a question of where are we giving money and understand it. And, and that process get, really opened my eyes to a few things because I realized there were some things that we weren't doing that we should be doing, some things that we were maybe overdoing that we didn't need to be doing. So um, we've used that as a framework for ourselves to figure out uh, which things we, we want to do. And um, we then can test things on that. So when something comes in that's in one of those areas, then we look and see, are we already invested enough in that area or not? Okay, is this something we should consider? And it gives us, it gives us a framework. Then we look at other criteria, like um, I think your question is a really good one of, you know, why give money to Yale when they have so much money? Because after all, you know, it's just a drop in the bucket. I'm not a billionaire. I'm not going to go, you know, give $100 million to build the next building here. I, I simply can't make that kind of an impact at Yale. So my impact is going to be far less. I, I gave money to the last campaign, and they, um, I, I dedicated it to uh, the new Bass Library just because that was such a big deal for me, uh, having spent CCL my whole <laughs> undergraduate career. <laughs> Um, and so, but it was, you know, it was enough to just get my plaque on the wall. So everybody calls it Donna's Wall. So you can go visit my <laughs> plaque on the wall at CCL. It wasn't a building. Uh, so I'm not going to make an impact at Yale like other people can. But um, the, <laughs> the um, you know, still I feel it's important to participate. So I choose to participate at Yale. Um, I know as a member of the corporation that a huge percentage of the cost of educating a student here is not paid by tuition, even somebody paying full tuition. So uh, one needs to get that, the rest of that from donations or from the endowment. And so I feel I attended here on somebody else's money to a great extent. And so I need to provide that for you guys and the next generation. So I feel sometimes I'm giving for participation purposes because I feel like it's an institution that was important to me that I want to participate. Other times I'm giving where I really feel like our money and the scale we can give will make a difference, where, um, uh, where we can have a direct impact on what's going to happen. And without us, it wouldn't happen. And so those are, we, we have a mix of those things, I would say. Thank you, Donna, for coming here this evening and sharing your wonderful insights with, uh, with our students. It is so important to have the vision shared cross-generationally for all you've achieved, especially as we face such inequality uh, in the world today and so many problems that need to be resolved. And hopefully with people like yourself giving back and sharing your talent, your time, and your treasure, we can do that. And so I ask you, what are you going to do to change the world?